On October 23, 2013, California State Assembly member from District 22, Kevin Mullen, and San Mateo County Supervisor Warren Slocum hosted the first annual Connect 13 conference at YouTube headquarters in San Bruno, California. Strengthening communities through social media was the theme. Bringing together social media experts and San Mateo County attendees from business, public, and government sectors to discuss the opportunities and challenges of using social media to communicate, collaborate, legislate, and participate. Peninsula Television is proud to bring you this conference, and all of the segments are available on YouTube and at www.pentv.tv slash connect13. The leader of our next panel um, is Marshall Wilson. Um, he's going to lead a panel entitled Navigating the Social Media Legal Maze. And I'll let uh, Marshall introduce his panelist. But often what prevents government from embracing these technologies, as uh, Charlene said this morning, is uh, the fear of failure. And, um, or we don't have time, or as was mentioned, we don't have the staff. But there are ways of utilizing social media tools effectively, as we heard earlier. And uh, our next panel will discuss some of the challenges and how those challenges can be addressed. As I said, the moderator is none other than our own Marshall Wilson, who spent 18 years as a journalist in the Bay Area before joining San Mateo County as communications director. He currently works daily with the news media and is responsible for developing communication strategies for a diverse array of projects and issues. His focus is on engaging the public in a conversation rather than pushing out information. Now you might not know about this about Marshall. You might not know this. He was dubbed by the Los Angeles Times as the dapper spokesman of San Mateo County. I'll bet you didn't know that. Marshall currently serves on the board of directors of Penn TV and hosts the critically acclaimed Peninsula Newsmaker Show, a 10-minute weekly program. He is also the current president of the San Francisco uh, Peninsula Press Club, a professional organization for journalists and public relations professional, professionals. And this summer, I guess we have to call you professor now. This summer he taught a workshop at Stanford University, continuing studies entitled Media Relations, Crisis and Opportunity. Uh, Marshall received an MA in journalism from Stanford University and a BA in political science from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And he lives in San Mateo County with his wife, Gina, and their beautiful five-year-old daughter, Isabella. Marshall? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And believe me, being called dapper by this uh, Los Angeles Times raises a high bar on my dress every single day. <laughs> but I've always been inspired by the words of T.S. Eliot, who once said, if you're not in over your head, how, how do you know how tall you are? We all know that as leaders, we should take risks. And diving into the deep sea of social media is certainly a risk. Consider that employees that are most likely to be fired, fined, disciplined, or even jailed for something said in social media are, in order, school teachers, nurses, and healthcare workers, with firefighters, police officers, and court clerks close behind. Probably a lot of you represent those very people, right? All, most public workers. And spontaneity, the very thing that makes Twitter, Facebook, and other tools so wonderful, can also be a nightmare with those with very fast fingers, especially for those in the public eye. Take, for example, a British politician who turned to Twitter to show his support for a plan to cut benefits to those who cannot speak English unless they learn it. Here is his tweet. Strongly support the loss of benefits unless claimants lean English. <laughs> yes, lean English. Being in over your head is the mark of leadership, but it could also lead to drowning and premature career suicide. Politicians must assume that everything they do is in the public eye. But what about people like me? I have a, my own private Facebook account. Is that something that can get me in trouble? Can it not get me in trouble? And what about negative comments on our blogs and Facebooks and tweets and everything we put out? What do we do about those? So that brings us to the difference between leadership and great leaders. Great leaders are prepared and planned for the risks that they take. I want to introduce our next two speakers. James Wagstaff over here is a partner and co-founder of the firm Kerr and Wagstaff. His practice focuses on complex litigation, legal ethics, and First Amendment matters. He is considered one of the most sought-after First Amendment lawyers in the country. 
He has represented broadcasters, newspapers, magazines, celebrities, and public officials, as well as a host of others, both as plaintiff and defendant. He's also committed to sharing his knowledge with us and others. He served as an instructor at the Federal Judicial Center's annual New Judges Workshop, educating newly appointed federal judges on all aspects of federal procedure. In addition, he also teaches at Hastings College of the Law, San Francisco State University, and Stanford University. He earned his law degree from Hastings. And Glenn Levy is a deputy county counsel for San Mateo County and a colleague I work with closely. His clients include San Mateo Medical Center, the county manager's office, that's my office, and we get in trouble quite a bit. Um, the county's health system, elections office, child protective services, and information services department. He provides counseling to clients in many areas, including employment issues, social media and technology, statutory interpretation, election procedure, contract negotiation, patient privacy, and medical ethics. And patient privacy is a big one with social media. He has helped to develop San Mateo County's social media policy and is looked upon as a leader in the law and social media. He has led workshops on social media for the National Association of Counties and other organizations. And prior to joining San Mateo County, he served as a, law, a clerk for a US Court of Appeals judge and is a litigation associate at two law firms. And he earned his law degree at Georgetown University Law Center. I'd like to invite both of them up here now. And they will help us prepare, for the, the, uh, prepare and plan for the risks we take. And as Charlene Lee noted, the loss of control, they might help us learn to embrace the loss of control. So Glenn, take it. Let me just get my uh, clicker out here. So I think we're going to do this more informally than uh, sitting up on uh, or at the podium. Uh, good afternoon. I'm thrilled to see so many of you still here. I've certainly spoken in uh, panels where a lot of people after lunch disappear, but I think it's uh, a tribute to the, the interesting topics that we've been covering today. So uh, thank you for having me here to speak. I, I wanted to start with this uh, cartoon, because that's always a great way to start the presentation. And if you take a second to read it, what I think this cartoon says to me, and I think to uh, all of you who are uh, in government and considering use of social media, <laughs> is that social media should be a tool. It should not be the story. And the presentation that we're going to uh, engage in right now is going to help you understand some of the key legal issues so that you can avoid having social media itself become the story. So I, I'm going to do a quick poll. Um, how many of you personally use social media? So that's most of the room, and I think that's really a sign of our times. Um, how many of you are with governmental entities that, you, that permit social media use for official business? So that's less, but still a, almost a majority, it looks like. And how many of your entities permit employees to use social media at work for personal use? So the County of San Mateo has uh, adopted a policy that allows that now, and I think uh, there's reasons for that, and we'll cover that soon. But I think it's good to know the answers to the questions. And how many of your entities have a social media policy? Again, I think given the number of hands that went up uh, for official use as well as for personal use, it's a good idea to have a social media policy. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk a little bit about today in the context of these legal issues. Why do we care about these issues? I think it's, in some ways it's obvious, but I like to highlight some of the reasons that I as a lawyer care about these issues, and I think that you should too. Social media is everywhere, as evidenced by the answers to those polls, which means your employees are using it all the time. Uh, it gives individuals broad power to publish with few barriers and without the editor role of traditional media. And I think this is a really key point. If you think back 20 or 30 years, people who had the power to publish had editors. They had people who read what they were going to publish before it got published. They had lawyers look at the legal ramifications, uh, First Amendment or defamation or other concerns. Now, with social media, we're all publishers, but we don't have an editor. We don't have a lawyer who can help us avoid those issues. And that's one of the reasons why it's really worth thinking about these before your entity starts to use social media. Also, social media is typically forever, and I know Jim, James is going to talk about that, but it's highly searchable, it's long-lasting, and that can cause a lot of problems. And it implicates a lot of uh, legal and social uh, or, uh, policy issues. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Again, I know we've talked about a lot of examples uh, already today. But there was an uh, airport in the UK that had a Facebook page. And they posted a picture in March of this year to highlight their own safety procedures. And below it, they had the statement, because we are such a super airport, this is what we prevent you from when it snows, we. And here's the picture. They posted a picture of a plane crash, I think from uh, Minneapolis St. Paul in 2005, where uh, one person died in that uh, accident. 
So the, uh, the post remained online only for about an hour, but that was enough for it to get screen captured and then posted on news sites. And then the airport spokesperson had to respond that they have social media guidelines, um, but an overenthusiastic member of their support team made an honest but misguided mistake and clearly stepped over the line. This is what I mean when I'm saying don't let social media become the topic. You want to do what you can through a policy and through understanding the legal issues that we'll cover today to help avoid letting social media become the story. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, social media and risk, understanding risks and the notions of innovation. We'll cover this uh, legal issues and then talk about drafting a policy if we have time at the end. Um, in order to draft a social media policy, you really have to understand how it works. And I think a lot of you, because you use it, know a lot about social media. But it's really important to familiarize yourself, especially if your department is thinking about using a new service, for example, Instagram or YouTube. If you don't really know how it works, it's going to be hard for you to help your department avoid the pitfalls. So take some time. Explore it. I know that you don't need to be an expert. But rely on your staff members or uh, colleagues who do have expertise or are willing to explore it and help you understand how those, uh, how those social media tools work. You want to learn how to make things private, how to delete posts, how to comment on things. So again, you can then affect how others uh, do that when you're using the site officially. I also think it's really important to understand the notion of risks versus innovation. Uh, the examples we're going to talk about today really reflect the risks that can occur, as that slide I just showed. Uh, was an example of, but there are a lot of benefits that, uh, to using social media, and a lot of those were covered this morning, but it can really ease communication and help you interact with the public. So as a matter of policy, you have to balance those risks and those benefits. Is the innovation worth it? And I think as James uh, will point out, it's happening anyway, and your, your employees, your department is going to use it anyway. So dive in and get used to it and learn the issues. These are the uh, six issues that we're going to cover. I'm going to focus on First Amendment. And I know James is an expert, so he should be the one really focusing. But I think between the two of us, we're going to give you a good introduction on some First Amendment law. We're also going to touch on the five, five other topics listed, some of them very quickly. Um, but we're going to have a chance for both of us to speak. And I think Marshall's going to really facilitate some questions and answers. Uh, but we want to give you these uh, topics so you understand that these are the areas we think there's the most risk and really uh, ways to avoid those risks. Uh, I start off with also some caveats. The law is really not developed here. There aren't always bright line rules. And it's evolving quickly. And sometimes the law doesn't evolve quickly enough to catch up. So uh, you should talk to your lawyers, talk to policymakers, and uh, understand that there's a balance between the legal and policy issues. And I want to jump on here yeah. about that. The, the political issues is really, is really true. So in a hierarchical organization, which most uh, public bodies are, you typically have a spokesman, the public information officer, the city manager, the county manager, someone like that, who when the media calls, you have to follow proper procedures, and that's the only person who can talk to the media. And then it comes to social media. Oftentimes, who's doing social media for public agencies? Interns. But does the news media and anyone else really delineate between what the intern says and what the county manager says? And that's the political implications. Whatever that tweet goes out, that next call might be to a member of the Board of Supervisors, say. And can I say that um, it, it is uh, somewhat Pollyannish to assume that uh, some of the bromides I used to give my kids, like, you should write more letters, or the bromides I used to give my clients, was you really shouldn't put it in writing. Uh, this is just not the world we're in. My favorite document produced in a case in the last five years said the following. It was an email, and it said, do not put this email in writing. Uh, uh, that's very revealing. Uh, here's a, a statistic I think you might find helpful. 93% of all emails are sent without being read by anyone until they're received. In other words, forget the editors. The person who's writing it doesn't read it. Uh, not just for typographical errors. I have made some doozy errors in briefs. May I share one with you? I represent the State Bar of California. I've been in the Supreme Court twice in the last month with lots of tough questions. But in a case I did five years ago, in the brief we submitted to the court, on the f always on the first page, an error that occurred because of that last change that we didn't check, we wrote, and I'm quoting, this case raises a matter of great pubic interest. Um, uh, so if you acknowledge that errors can be made, and you acknowledge this is entirely there, then you will ignore what my father, my late father, some of you knew him, my late father said to me 
about 16 years ago, right, shortly before his death, he told me that the fax machine was the end of the practice of law. The fax machine, because it eliminated time for reflection. Uh, as I drove on Sneath Lane coming here and drove past the cemetery, just thinking about the number of people there who would not even know what we're talking about today. They wouldn't understand it, because we live in a world where it's all around us. The topics that, that we're going to talk about, the legal aspects, arise because this is the communications out there. Oh, we still write memos occasionally, and we have phone calls, but it's all, it emails everything. So let me tell you this. The most recent study by Yahoo said there are 288 billion emails sent in this country every day. 288 billion. And to put that in context, that's 100 trillion emails a year. Now, can I help you with that context? If you had 60 seconds equaling a minute, which we do, a million seconds would equal uh, a million seconds would equal 12 days. A trillion seconds, because there's 100 trillion emails sent a year, a trillion seconds would equal 31,688 years. That's how big a trillion is. Years. So that's we have 100 trillion emails being sent every day. In litigation, of course, in, in communicating with people, those emails are fair game. Uh, they are fair game. And so I start with the notion that it's all out there. And what we're going to talk about, we can close our eyes and say, well, let's just have policies where we don't do it as much. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen whether it's on Facebook or otherwise. That people put funny things on Facebook is one of the things that gets people into our offices. Well, of the 100 trillion, has any study been done of how many are actually useful? Seven. That, <laughs> seven. That high. Yeah, it's, it's that's seven. better than. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, there's, there's some that are going up. It's trending. It's getting better. OK, so freedom of speech. This is my little uh, civics lesson. And I know James, who's a con law professor, will uh, chime in, I think. But I think it's really helpful to give everybody the quick 10-minute version of freedom of speech. Because I think we don't think about it in a society once we're out of you know, uh, middle school or high school. We don't tend to read the Constitution again. And you think about it, you throw these terms around, oh, freedom of speech. But I think it's really important as government uh, actors that we are to talk about it and to understand what is freedom of speech. So both the United States and the California constitutions guarantee freedom of speech. In the US Constitution, the First Amendment, which is part of the Bill of Rights, states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom, freedom of speech. I've underlined the parts that I'm uh, talking about today. Uh, the California Constitution, Article 1, has the Declaration of Rights. Uh, Section 2A says that every person may freely speak, write, and publish his or her sentiments on all subjects and a law may not restrain or abridge liberty of speech. Now, these rules only apply to the government. They do not apply to private individuals or entities. So while YouTube can take action to limit the speech of its employees, as government actors, we have more restrictions on what we can do. So that's why we care about it in the context of using social media. When other entities use social media, they don't tend to have to worry about freedom of speech, but we do. Um, when we do regulate speech, uh, the rules say that we can regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But the rules must generally be viewpoint neutral. And that's a key aspect of freedom of speech. And we'll talk about what that means. Again, why do we care? Because your entity uh, as a school or a city or a county or a town is subject to the Constitution. And when you create what's called a forum for speech, you lose much of the ability to control the content of speech in that forum. And then that gets us into the realm of the risks that I was talking about earlier of using social media and preparing for those risks so you don't get into trouble when you decide that you want to use social media. So what is a forum? And I have this great picture of the forum in Rome. Um, and that's really where the, the phrase comes from. But a forum is a place that is made available for the public to engage in speech. Uh, it can be a town square, a meeting, a bulletin board, or an online resource. And I think what you need to think about that is social media can be a forum and often is a forum. And the notion is that the government should not restrict speech in these kinds of important public spaces because speech is a key component of our democracy. So I think that makes a lot of sense once you think about it. There is an assumption here that I just want to put on the uh, put out there, which is that governmental use of social media implicates the First Amendment. I think the conservative view, the more safe view, is that it does. Um, you could have lawyers or others that would say that it does not because it's Facebook that's hosting the speech, not the county of San Mateo. I don't think that's a winning argument. 
And I think you really want to think about whether you'd want to make that argument in front of a judge. I certainly wouldn't. And regardless, even if you're right legally, if you have speech that you take down because you think it's not proper and you violated the First Amendment, you may have lost the PR battle already, even if it's not, uh, if you haven't addressed the legal issue. The PR issues uh, might already be decided against you. Well, I think taking down a post is an important point as well. This is a few years ago. We were talking about in the county developing our social media policy. And I was discussing this with some of my PIO colleagues. And I said, well, what would you do if something very negative is said on that? It's like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll just take it down. Any response to that? Well, just, just take it down doesn't, first of all, it was there, for starters. Mm -hmm. And to the extent you're hosting it and there's liability, you don't escape it by taking it down. But, uh, and it doesn't mean it's not accessible, of course, because once it's up, uh, it is uh, certainly in litigation, it's findable, and it's findable through most, most techniques. And even on old web pages, you can find by just going on the Wayback Machine. So you can, that doesn't necessarily mean that you get off the hook by taking it down. It might seem, however, forget law for a minute, acting prudently is still the right thing to do. So if it shouldn't be up there, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my dad said to me, act as if it was on the front page of the newspaper. Well, that, how old-fashioned is that concept? I can't even, my kids don't even know what I'm talking about. So I say, imagine, I ask them, kids, if they have a cell phone, can they take pictures? And I imagine if they're taking pictures of their daily life, would they be proud to have someone they respect look at it? I don't know if that's a good ethical standard, but at least it gets you thinking about it might be prudent to protect against things that are there. So this next slide talks about the different kinds of forms you can create. And I think this is maybe the most legally technical slide I'm going to present today. But I think it's really helpful for you to understand that there are different types of forms you can create. And with some of them, you as a government ent entity have a lot more control. And with some of them, you really have very little control. So as you start on the left side of, that, uh, of this continuum here, you have more control. And that would be information sharing only. And the example I put up there is a static web page with news. So if San Mateo County has uh, the Board of Supervisors website and they put up occasional news about the Board of Supervisors, that's really information sharing only. It doesn't implicate many First Amendment issues. The public doesn't have the right to post on it. They can't respond. They could send in a comment or an item to a member of the Board of Supervisors. And if that got posted, that's really the choice of the county as an entity. It's not that individual speaking per se on that site. So the county has a lot of control there. The second area would be what's called a non-public forum, which is restricted access. And a good example of this is San Mateo County used what's called Yammer.com. And Yammer is a basically an internal facing Facebook-like uh, uh, social media use where county employees can make comments and network. But it's not, uh, it's not something that the public as large can see or access. With this, the county can impose a lot of restrictions on what goes on, or at least more restrictions. But there are still First Amendment protections there. The third realm on this continuum, we're starting to lose more control, but it's the one that I think most of you are going to end up using. And this is what's called a limited public forum, where you can restrict speech to certain topics. And I think a really great example is a budget priority input page. Uh, the county manager's office in San Mateo a year or two ago opened up a page for the public to post comments and ideas for uh, changing the county's budget. And people could respond on those issues, but the subject matter was really related and restricted to the budget. So if a member of the public posted something that had no bearing at all on the budget or the budgetary process, it probably could have been removed. And then the last area here, which is really where you lose control, is a, what's called a designated or a fully public forum. And this might be a fully open Facebook page. If you open a Facebook page and don't set up any restrictions on what can be posted, members of the public can post whatever they want. They can post links to articles. They can respond to comments. And you basically lose most control. You can't just take down comments you don't like. And, uh, let me let you comment on this. If you well, I mean, there's, there's a, of course, a longstanding doctrine that the government is not supposed to engage in prior restraint of speech before it's issued. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, it's, but it's not unlimited, of course. I mean, it's a, it's that we know that national security is an example where they can, they can restrict speech. We know that uh, there are rights and conflicts. So when we saw that slide from the First Amendment that said, Congress shall make no law, when I teach that in my undergraduate class uh, to journalists, I, they like that. They get on their soapbox. And I say, OK, let's try one out. How about, uh, uh, and I said, don't try this at home, but how about you're walking uh, through the metal detector at the airport, and you say to the TSA agent, hey, you know, I love having bombs, but I don't know whether to put it through the detector or not. 
And I asked them, would someone come and arrest them? And they say, yes. I said, even if you don't have a bomb? They said, yes. I said, that's because there are rights in conflict, in that case, the right of security, uh, whereas I said, if you're singing a song about bombs in the airport at home in the shower, and your nosy neighborhood calls the police, that you have a right to do. So we weigh and balance those rights. But here, we're talking about possibly excluding access. And so the, I mean, the general rules, of course, as this screen tells us, the more open access it is, the less you can control content. You're, anytime you, you, you restrict speech based on content, that's viewpoint discrimination. And the question is what rights you have, and then the court will weigh and balance to some extent how reasonable it is that you do that. Remember, this is to, when you, the government or others, choose to limit access. The flip side is can you be held responsible, notwithstanding free speech protections, for either hosting speech that is other, or communications that are otherwise uh, going to give rise to liability? And I think, you know, I know we're going to talk about it, but the number one area is defamation which is an area I practice in a great deal, which is you say something or you host something that is false and defamatory. That is, it lowers someone's reputation and it's false. If it is true or substantially true, then of course that's a complete uh, uh, defense to any lawsuit. But is it false? Uh, I have a case going right now, though, it's very interesting, in Marin County, in which uh, I'm representing a, a company that's suing for posts that were made on sort of one of these disgruntled employee web pages, you know, anonymous. And so we filed a John Doe suit to find out who it was. Boy, that's very uh, law of us. And the judge, in order to allow us to get the discovery, has to conclude that it's, the case has some viability. And the judge said to me in court the other day, good judge, said, you know, I don't see how even false negative things online are actually ever treated as fact. She said, isn't it all like scrawlings on the bathroom wall? And there are some cases in the last two months, decided in our Court of Appeal, that have suggested that there's greater freedom for opinionated statements, either to make them or to, or to, or to host them, greater fr freedom if it's online. Because, believe it or not, people don't believe all the stuff they read on there. Although I did say to the judge, all right, judge, I will go into the bathroom right now, and I will scrawl on the wall that you're on the take, you're corrupt, and my opponent has paid you $10,000 for this hearing. And she said to me, Mr. Wag said, I thought you were going to give that example. <laughs> I, didn't think, I, didn't, I wonder what she thinks of me. Uh, and I was trying to highlight the issue that maybe even bathroom scrawling is, can be negative because it can lower someone's reputation. If you've ever been the subject of an attack, or you've been the subject of a cyber attack, as some of you have, or you're, you just run your name on Google and you say, how can that be out there? Uh, you know how uh, sensitive we can be to reputations. And I want to say, any of you have a question during this, just jump on. You don't have to wait to the end. So if you have a question about First Amendment, any of that, just pop on up and let's go with it. Yes? <clears throat> the judge has decided that I have not proven enough evidence yet to show it's a meritorious suit. And she's allowed me to go and take 15 depositions of former employees and ask them a single question, were you the source of this, this online post? So that's next. And presumably, if I go back and say, I tried, judge, no one's owning up to it. Maybe she'll let me do some discovery. It will be interesting to see. She's a good judge. It's a close call. But it highlights this. The First Amendment does not protect. We, know, we all sort of know it doesn't protect obscenity. If, if, if the First Amendment's an umbrella and it protects communications, expression, and speech, we know that some things are outside the protection of that umbrella. Obscenity is one we know. If it's obscene speech, it's not protected by the First Amendment. I want to say something that might, you might not so well. Deliberately false speech is not protected by the First Amendment. So it's, you don't have a right to defame someone if it's false and done so with, with, with deliberately. And there might be defenses, but that, that's privileges and things of that nature. But it's, there's no First Amendment protection for false speech. Having said that, the Supreme Court has told us, I love this phrase, there is no such thing as a false idea. So at the end of this program, you write a review of me. My colleagues will get nothing but positive reviews. But you say, he is the most boring presenter I have ever heard. I think he should retire from public speaking. Uh, he, he loved to hear himself speak. His initials, his name is Jim for the acronym, Jaws in Motion. And you write all that. <laughs> Someone wrote that up at me once, that's why I have it. <laughs> Jim Wagstaff believes that free speech is not only a right, it's a continuing obligation, they wrote. All right, that's all opinion. And you're given broad protection to express opinion, but the more you contextualize it, the more you tell the reader, the viewer, the, the, the person who goes on social media that this is your opinion, the less likely someone will say you're implying a false fact. So if you write, Jim Wagstaff's an unethical lawyer, that's closer. 
Because now you're implying you know facts that are false, that I've done something specific that's unethical. So if you, if you set forth the basis for your conclusions and tell the readers or the viewers that it is opinionated, the law gives you greater protection. So I think that Judge Duryea is you know, partially onto something. She's saying we have to take into account that when people see things online, they do tend to think it's a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I was just saying before the program, I'm trying so many cases these days, it's all electronic documents, because that's how 90, 94% of all data maintained by businesses and governments is maintained electronically. The notion of the paperless world's coming upon us. And the notion that's still a smoking gun, they whip the email up there on the screen, it's one of 10 million emails, yet that's the, the critical window to the soul of the witness and Bill Gates has to answer for his emails. Jurors, as they get younger, meaning any, to me now anybody under 50, uh, who have lived with it all the time, they realize that that's just one snapshot in time. And therefore, I think Judge Duryea is saying, we might have more flexibility for opinions online because people understand the sourcing. So uh, just a quick case study that relates to technology and freedom of speech. Um, Facebook changed its technology, its interface, about a year ago, and it used to be that you could turn off the ability of followers on your county page, for example, the County Human Resources page in uh, San Mateo County, to the public to post comments. So it was more of information sharing only, that first category that we talked about where they had most control. So you can see here, this was a post on the uh, San Mateo County HR page that it gave information about a holiday, and you could like it and you could share it, but you couldn't comment on it. And Facebook made a change. Uh, without really the uh, county's department knowing, which suddenly turned on commenting. And you can see here, here's another uh, post from the HR page that allowed somebody to make a post about uh, wearing red and gold that weekend. Um, but what that change did is it switched the HR's Facebook page from an information sharing only page where HR could control everything that got posted to more of a public forum because suddenly the public could comment and HR didn't know about this, and they didn't know that there were legal ramifications for it. So it, I think that the takeaway of this case study is be aware of the technology you're using and monitor it. If you're going to use social media, you actually want to be checking it out. And when there are changes, touch base. Touch base with your social media policy or with your council, because I think it will very much help you uh, figure out if there are any pitfalls. I think I'm going to try to uh, breeze through some of these on freedom of speech because I want to be able to get to some other conversations. Jim, do you want to talk about viewpoint neutral restrictions a little bit? Well, the, um, uh, you have, uh, generally speaking, the government is supposed to be viewpoint neutral. That's it, when it, with, to, with respect to the fact that the statements, the re restrictions it's placing on speech. So as a general rule, uh, you're not, particularly if it's political speech, you're not supposed to say you can say this, but you can't say that. Uh, there, are, there are authorities that allow you to have limited, as we said, limited access where you limit what, certainly what remains posted. It's kind of hard to control uh, if people can just press a button and make a comment. That's uh, pretty hard to control that in the inception. You can only control it by removal. And removal could be a First Amendment violation. Uh, I want to say, however, though, that uh, there's a difference between what is illegal and get, expose you to liability and what is improper or imprudent. That is what you should be, make good choices about. So on legality, uh, our California Supreme Court in a case called Rosenthal has held that generally speaking, those who host web pages or internet service providers like, like America Online or Google or Yahoo or others, they are not liable for statements made by others. They, they are not liable for statements made by others. So the normal rule of liability is if, if one of these gentlemen says uh, that uh, someone else is a convicted criminal, and I repeat it, the mere fact that I've repeated what they say, I'm liable for repeating it. I'm liable for what I repeat someone else said because uh, we are, the First Amendment doesn't protect false rumor mongering. However, there are protections. So if you are a newspaper, for example, and you report something that's in a public record, that's protected. If you, if you are hosting it online as a matter of law, the Supreme Court tells us, you are permitted to host something that might be false and negative, and you're not responsible, the person who posted it is responsible. Hence, I'm not suing. Uh, this case against the internet service provider, I'm simply seeking discovery from them to tell me who was the source. By the same token, that doesn't mean it's prudent or appropriate. And there may be, it seems to me, if we run into one of our other legal roadblocks, defamation, privacy, copyright infringement, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, if you see those things, the law does allow even public entities to, to restrain and restrict, schools in particular, 
uh, where there's a limited right of a speech, more limited right for students, have a right to control libel, privacy, invasion, uh, you know, copyright infringement, et cetera. Sure. So there are some restrictions if you do use uh, social media. Um, as long as the restrictions are neutral to everybody, the, the restrictions should be clear, objective, and unambiguous. And uh, you should set them in advance. For example, if you're limiting topic to only items that relate to the school board agenda or only items that relate to the public library on the library's page. Um, if you set them in advance and you enforce them over time uniformly, and if you enforce them uniformly across all users, you're in good shape. But if you start to enforce them uh, not uniformly, and you're singling out an individual who might uh, be saying something you don't like, that's where you can get into trouble. So, um, you know, as Jim mentioned before, you can do some restrictions. You can prevent profane language, violent or threatening language, uh, conduct of illegal, illegal activity or uncivil behavior, although I'm actually very cautious about that last one. I think that's a hard, uh, hard one to prove, that you're justified in removing a comment that is uncivil. I think it has to interfere so much with the forum that the forum no longer becomes a good forum, and I think that's a tough uh, battle to fight, so I wouldn't rely on that. But I do want to point out some examples of speech that you might not be able to restrict. And this is where you want to think in advance. If you're going to use social media, make sure that you're comfortable with it. So criticism, criticism of a program board member or department head. For example, Supervisor Jones is a fascist who doesn't care about people. If you're deciding that the Board of Supervisors is going to have a Facebook page and allow comments, you have to be ready for a comment like this. And you can't take it down because this is core political speech. Uh, suggestions that call for the elimination of a cherished program or service. For example, the first five library project is a waste of money. Those kids can't learn anyway. If the Facebook program or page is about the first five program, this is a legitimate response to that Facebook page. Um, or, for example, satire or content that arguably has artistic merit. Uh, for example, for its next feat, the board will turn Death Valley into a water park. <laughs> You know, that's probably something that you can't remove because it's criticism of the government in general. So if you decide you want to use Facebook or other social media, be aware that there's going to be some content you can't take down. Um, and you can really work with your policy and with counsel to figure out uh, what's going on there. I want to give another example just to show how tricky this can get. San Mateo County passed an ordinance uh, that prohibits the use of plastic bags without charging a fee at supermarkets. I know San Francisco has a similar ordinance. It went, to, it went into effect this year, and the county's health system has a Facebook page where they generally promote issues that relate to community health. And so on the Facebook page, this is a, a page screen capture from the health system's Facebook page, uh, they had an, uh, a post this year about the uh, reusable bag tips. And you'll see down here there's a, a citizen who uh, issued a comment and said, don't forget about the SF bag ban. They found a 46% rise in foodborne illness deaths. The bottom line, our results suggest that San Francisco ban led to conservatively 5.4 additional annual deaths. Now, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with this citizen's comment, there was a new news article in San Francisco that talked about the San Francisco plastic bag ban and how that might not have been a good idea. But this didn't stop here. Again, the, the health system's Facebook page was intending to give information out to the public about this issue that they care about. And yet this citizen posted again and again and again on these issues. And she cared very strongly about them. And when you're the health system, you have a limited way of responding because her comments are on topic. They were directly responding to what the health system put up. Um, this one, though, in particular, uh, this, I got a call on this because you can see here that she said that um, she was told by a San Mateo County official, quote, either they will learn or they will get sick, unquote. And my reply, what if they die? Is it still a good idea to have this ban? And her, meaning the employee's response, was allegedly, well, they have to learn, unquote. Gurr, this was last Monday, and I can give you her name. So basically, the citizen is saying, I called somebody within the county, and they were dismissive of this public health concern. Now, I talked to the uh, department, and I know that's not what the employee said, but the health system didn't have a way publicly they could respond to this and disprove what she claimed that citizen had said without, I mean, maybe you could file a defamation suit, but it's not a good context to do that. Um, and then you're attacking a citizen who's commenting on something that you've put out there as a department. So you'll see here, the health system did respond and tried to take her response seriously and give her an avenue for addressing it. And this is really what's key, I think, in a social media policy is having good guidance for how to respond for these problematic posts that you might disagree with in a way that's civil and respectful of the members of the public. So here's my question. Did you write that? 
I did not. Oh. I think the health system has their own uh, PR sort of contact okay. person, and together they crafted this solution. The the having having standards you apply <clears throat> across the board, I think, is, is the message that we're getting here, which is, if you're going to take things down, that you you have standards by which you can do so. So if someone's engaging in in deliberately false and uh, speech about someone else, uh, that's appropriate. If someone's invading privacy by disclosing someone's social security number or something of that nature, of course you could take that down. We're going to talk about copyright to extend someone's posting things that are otherwise protected. If you have standards, then the the last standard is called the thick skin standard, and the thick skin standard is that you read this stuff and you have a thick skin sometimes, and you realize. If it makes you feel better, it goes into the etherized world. Things happen. You know, it's, it's been a long time coming. In 1895, 1895, in the state of Ohio, there were two automobiles in the entire state, and they collided. <laughs> the only two automobiles in the whole state, they collided. The, the big surprise that we have collisions online with, you know, thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of messages. If you, if you don't think I, take, I, I uh, try to follow my own lesson, just go to YouTube. We're in the right building. Go to YouTube and look up. My argument before the Supreme Court, where I was arguing for the state bar to allow undocumented immigrants to become lawyers, big high profile case, very interesting case. Go watch, go watch the whole argument. First, my two brothers, Steve, the DA included, decided they would send me a personal critique about my argument. That was very thoughtful of them. Uh, and then the, the 5,000 comments were very interesting as well. I mean, and the answer is, I thought I wouldn't read any of them, but you know, it's like watching the car crash. I felt the need to read some of them. And then after the torrid, you know, someone said he, he didn't like my shoes. Now that, well, that's an important comment. He didn't like the shoes I was wearing. But nevertheless, I read some of them. I thought it was thoughtful, and I had a thick skin, and I, you know, I'm seeing a therapist. That's not a problem. <laughs> All right, so that's the idea. I think you had a question in back. You said that the health department didn't really have a way of responding, but actually, in your next breath, you said this is how they responded and that you should be ready for it. So yeah, so let me, be, let me be clear. The response was not to be able to take down these posts, and I advised them, do not do that. That violates the policy that we have drafted and actually posted on this specific health, uh, health system page, and it's not a good way because then this uh, citizen would likely go to the press and say, you know, I'm critical and I have a validity in my views and they took down my comment and then it's creating a PR storm. So the, what I meant to say more correctly is there is a way to respond, which is to do it appropriately and offer other uh, sort of netiquette um, ways of responding, en engage that citizen in a different uh, forum or provide them an alternative and then have a thick skin and move on. Well, and I, these guys know it, PR and, and good, good lawyers, but it is also sensible that you follow basic rules of trying avoid using adjectives and adverbs. There's a tendency to, to respond with adjectives and adverbs, and if you write it and then knock out adjectives and adverbs, you'll find you've automatically become more neutral in your response. Second is remember the lesson if you raise teenagers, which is you must listen through tone. You raise teenagers, you gotta listen through tone. They say some pretty remarkable things to you when they're in those teenage years, and if you remember to listen through tone and listen to the words, now with teenagers, of course, the real lesson is to set up as many times as possible to talk with them when they, you don't have to make eye contact. They will talk to you at ball games and in cars. So that's just a little tip that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> but what happened here, which is why this is so good, and I think your comment is, is quite, quite germane, is they tried to lower the volume, be straight about it, recognize that in all interactions you're not gaining anything by rising to the bait and fighting, and I, I suspect that would be the public relations answer as well, yet nevertheless having a response that is, uh, is a little rope-a-dope. You're going to take the punches and not let it know that it happened. Yeah, I'm a big believer in a thick skin. But I also have an example here of how not to respond to, to negative criticism. So there was a Muslim cultural center, and they were uh, tweeting about their building their, their mosque and the progress of it. And someone sent them a critical tweet. And so this was the response from the official Muslim cultural center Twitter account. <clears throat> the person who was criticizing them had Amish in their handle. And I said, Amish saying stop Muslims? What are you doing on the computer? That's not very Amish. Shouldn't you be making butter? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> an example of what not to do. Now, they blamed it on an intern. Ooh. But they became the news, as Glenn said. How you respond is going to become the story. It's not necessarily what's said, but how you respond. 
So the takeaway on the First Amendment issue, and we're going to move on to the, some of the other issues, is just be very cautious and be aware. You do have some power to restrict uh, certain uh, areas if you set the rules in advance and work with counsel, work with your social media policy, and then be respectful and have a thick skin. And I think you're going to be okay. Don't let that stop you from engaging in social media from uh, a work perspective. So the second issue, and I'm just going to mention this very briefly, but this is important for all of us in California, is that there are public meetings laws, the Brown Act, that applies uh, below the level of the state legislature. And this prohibits members of a board uh, from discussing issues as a large group outside of public meetings. If you have a majority of the board, for example, talking about an item and they're not in a meeting, they're violating the Brown Act. And again, you can talk with counsel about the specifics here. But what can happen with social media is that meetings can occur serially. So if you have a uh, Facebook page for the Board of Supervisors and a citizen posts something, if we have three members of our board respond to that comment, suddenly we have a majority of the board responding and we have a Brown Act violation. So what we've done is we've let our Board of Supervisors know and we let our departments know, if you're going to use social media, you can't have responses from board members. Or maybe you select one that can respond, or you have the department head respond instead of the board member. But you really want to set this up in advance so, again, you avoid issues. And I think there's not a lot to say on this. Certainly James might talk, but... No, no, that's, you got it. I think just be aware of it because we're all public entities and this is something that can put our board members in a, in a tricky position and we don't want to do that. Uh, public records laws are very similar in California. Public entities have a duty to keep public records. And again, the safer interpretation, in my view, is that posts and comments on social media are arguably public records. Now, this is tricky because Facebook, for example, is hosting the actual record. The county of San Mateo isn't. But if we get a Public Record Act request for the information that's been posted on our HR Facebook page, I think my take is we need to go collect those comments. Um, and it can be really tricky if you're just depending on the regular Facebook interface to go get those comments. You're going to have to have somebody scroll back and get all those comments. But there are some technological tools you can use. For example, there are apps, sort of applications that work with Facebook that will send you an email in relation to every comment on your department's Facebook page. And that's a great way to archive it. That way you have an email for every comment or like or update, and you can just search those. So again, just be aware that you might have an obligation to keep that social media archived and accessible, and I know Jim's going to, I think, has Well, let me just say that. that in addition to the public records law, to the extent there's any possibility of litigation arising from the, from the topics that are at, at, at stake, then you have an obligation to preserve the documents for potential litigation. Uh, what one court called, when there's the sound of gunfire, you must preserve the weapons, and that is the ability of each side to get documents. The courts in the, in the last two years have been holding more and more that social media documents are, in fact, documents that are subject to, to to, to production and litigation. There might be privacy rights in certain cases, but uh, so it's not just the public records law, which is obviously very important, because the public records law under the statute, of course, applies to not only documents the government creates, but documents it maintains. And, uh, and then if there's document destruction policies, they should not be, they should be suspended when there's potential litigation as to anything that's relevant, suspended. I mean, that's literally suspended. Uh, and then second of all is, uh, uh, and to the extent you have, you have the ability to maintain it, any, any destruction policies have to be uniform, not, not uh, because you want to get rid of those documents. That's not very helpful on the witness stand, by the way. You don't have that document, so that's one we got rid of. So the next topic is uh, sort of under confidentiality, but I really relate to this, to privacy and consent. And because social media turns everybody into a publisher of content, it makes it very easy to violate uh, protections on privacy or confidentiality. So I think it's important to have a policy and consent forms. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of the areas of uh, uh, where you can get into trouble with this, just to be aware of it. So there are different kinds of information that can be confidential. Employment or HR information about specific employees can be confidential. That could be performance issues or evaluations. Benefits information in some ways can be confidential. Um, confidential discussions like attorney-client communications, sensitive negotiations are sometimes confidential, and closed session items for boards that are subject to the Brown Act. The disclosure of those on social media can actually be a violation of the Brown Act. So you want to be aware of that. Um, law enforcement activities, some of them might be protected, some family court documents, juvenile court documents, uh, some services provided to the indigent are actually confidential. Um, 
and voter information and tax information and HIPAA or health information can all be confidential. So if you have any interaction with those informations, if you're a school and you have a school nurse, you want to be careful if that nurse is going to be posting on Facebook. You don't want to be posting any information about students and their uh, medical information. And let me give you a, an example here of what I call consent, which is the flip side of that. So this is a web page from San Francisco Public Library, and they had an opening day. And you see here there's this great photo of families checking out the library. And then there's this very sweet photo on their Facebook page of a little girl playing with a toy that talks about the library's green features. And there are other similar examples. I have two layer uh, counties public library. This is a photo with a lot of family members. And then uh, the Sacramento uh, Office of Ed has this uh, photo of a teacher who got an award and a, uh, a pupil or a young girl. My concern is I don't know that any of those families gave consent to have their children's images posted on Facebook. And as a lawyer, if I were representing those libraries or other entities, I'd have real concerns. Because in California, I believe the parent has the right to control whether their child's photo is posted on Facebook. And as a governmental entity, if you're a school or a library, you should really be touching base before you're posting anyone's photo, in my view, whether it's an adult or a child. Get a signed consent form from them, or even an employee. I had a question recently of, well, can we take videos of this employee exercise for disaster preparedness and then post those on Facebook? Even if you're allowed to do that because it's part of the employee's job, why wouldn't you ask for consent from those employees? And if one of them says, no, I don't want my video or my photo on Facebook, then don't post it. And I think it's just a good rule of thumb to respect everybody because you don't want to be in a situation where the parent then calls the press and says that your entity posted photos of their little child without their permission. In, in writing, particularly if it's anyone 14 or under, in writing. because. Uh, there's an excellent argument that people under the age of 14 can't give consent, period. So you have to get it from the parents or in some limited circumstances from a school official or someone else who's, who's, in, who's their guardian. But uh, I, I represent the media, and I just say, pictures of kids, I want written consents, always. And when they show me the picture, can we use it, I say, do you have a written consent? Without it, we don't use it, unless it's literally in the middle of some major event. So in my past life, I, was, I worked in the news business. And we were always told that if someone is in the public, in the public they have no right, or no expectation of privacy. So we could take a picture of anyone on a street corner, sidewalk, in a park, and put it in the newspaper. You no could, consent. you could. There's a wonderful case, which you're relying on, in which the court, the California court held that two people kissing in a park have impliedly consented because they're in a park. They, they're using the great Latin phrase, so if you learn no other Latin today, you learn this, sin volenti non injuria, to the willing, there is no injury. So you go to a ball game, you hit by a foul ball. But it has to be someone who has the capacity to consent. And the law generally recognizes that children don't have the capacity to consent. I tell my reporters, don't go to somebody's house, the five-year-old enters the door, and you say, where are mommy and daddy? They're upstairs. Hey, could I come in? Uh, this is not going to get do you very well in front of a jury or in common sense. Ask yourself, does the person have the power to consent? So yes, people are in public. You can take pictures of them. With the, there's an anti-paparazzi statute in this state now after Princess Diana's death, in which even in public, if they're using Zoom lenses or directional mics and picking up familial activity in the beach, that's a violation of privacy, particularly for celebrities. But children can't consent. So we're on to topic five out of six, so we're in the home stretch here. Oh, there's a question in the back. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Just a quick question. Um, Nancy McGee from the San Mateo County Office of Education. Because we're kind of an outer agency that circles around school districts, if um, families have signed consent forms within their own school district, does that apply then to the outer agency? For instance, in, the, in a public library, they might have consent forms for their, their customers, but does that apply to the County of San Mateo Facebook page as well, not just the library page? Well, well it, you have to look at the scope of the consent. That's, if it's in writing, you can read it. I represented Channel 4 in a case some years ago in which we used someone's picture on the news, and then we sold it to the airline news. And he sued because they said, I consented to be on your news program, not to be on airline news. And, uh, and he, had a, he had a point. And so the same is here. So you'd start with a consent form. Uh, schools, the law does not prevent schools from being what it calls parents patri in certain circumstances, providing the consent for the child. Because while the child is school, at least, there are some access forms. Some parents may not like that. But in any event, I still think in that situation, if the kids, I mean, I listen, in the, re, in the real world, these kids are probably thrilled to have their picture online. 
all the more reason to get the written consent because they'll say yes. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the reality, I think. And I think the answer is um, you want to be careful about what the consent said. I mean, if it's the school that's taking the photo and it's really the school posting it on their web page, but it was at a different venue, you might be OK. But I think that it's always a better idea to sort of double check and get an extra consent form. Just that way you're going to avoid any problem. It does happen all the time. Yeah, if you go on Facebook, you can find, I am, don't ask me why I'm doing this, but I'm going to a grade school reunion. This is a, everything about this sounds wrong, but I'm going. because, And so someone posts on their Facebook page a photo of our second grade class picture. This is annoying to me. And not that I wasn't a very handsome child at, at six, but the fact is that there I am out there. The answer is you're not going to do anything about it. That strikes me as the real world we live in. Consents of things where you really can easily get the consents, like the photos on that web page, strike me as just go get it. So just really quickly, I think social media can implicate labor and employment issues. And I'm going to just highlight a few. And I know that Jim might have an, a few other th thoughts. But it's very easy for employees to comment on work conditions or on discipline uh, or to make anonymous comments. And we've had all of these in San Mateo County. And I've gotten calls on all of these. Or also because employees might be using social media for personal use during breaks at work, which, again, is our policy in the county. They're allowed to do that. But you want to be sure that your policy works within the confines of your broader HR policies. And you don't want to be overly restrictive in some areas. Um, it can be challenging, but employees, for example, have a right to talk about what's called concerted action. So if they're critical of their workplace conditions, you as the employer can't necessarily keep them from doing that. So if they're on their Facebook page and they're commenting on the conditions at work and the hours that they have to work and being very um, disharmonious and critical, you might not be able to discipline them for that. And so it's good for you to be aware of that before you sort of go down that trap. Yeah, you can have, of course, a policy that says that they, you can have limitations on use of social media during, during work hours. Uh, you can, but this is different on your personal Facebook page. And you can, you can make it very clear that their email accounts on your system belong to the employer, hence uh, that you can look at them if you deem it appropriate. But that's, those are, you need clear policies there to avoid invasion of privacy. So the last topic, and then we'll just uh, switch to social media policy, and I think then we'll be done, um, is copyright and IP issues. And I think it's just good to be aware, IP stands for intellectual property, that <clears throat> when you become a publisher with social media, it's very easy to post information that's created by other people where the other person has the right. So video clips, music, or other uh, forms of artistic expression might be copywritten. And if you are posting that or reposting it, <clears throat> you can be violating their copyright. So you want to be aware of that and have a good policy on it. I think it's, I don't know that it's fully settled, but I think posting a link to a news article is pretty safe these days. Um, I think, though, if you copy and paste the entire news article and post it on your page, then you can run into trouble because you're really reprinting without permission. So just be aware that when you have social media use, you can run afoul if you're republishing uh, information or content that somebody else owns the right to. Well, let's, let's be clear. I always ask on copyright infringement, first of all, if you post something someone else created, it's not yours. Ask the first question, did you create it? If you did not create it, someone else owns the copyright. End of story. I'll give you the biggest myth. If you download it, it's in the public domain. No such thing. Uh, if someone else created it, you run the risk of copyright infringement. That's number one. And you think, oh, no, I'll just put, do a little post and I'll download a picture uh, and no one will do it. You know, there are now, there are now photographers. I represent photographers. They sign up for a service in which this, a company searches for people who download their photographs. And they send, that service sends a letter and says, by the way, you owe me $800 for that use because it's an infringement. The only exception would be, a, if you don't have a license or consent, would be a fair use, such as this program right now. This is a fair use. It's educational to one-time only persons. On the other hand, if we took these slides from these pictures, that some of which are not yours, you didn't create them, and then we, we write a book, we get, we get sued for copyright infringement. And I represent a lot of photographers, and this is, they, they ought to get paid for their work. When my kids were you know, downloading songs, you remember the Napster time? They said, well, Dad, it's online. I said, it's a violation of the rights of the artist. Why are you doing it? You know? And then what they started doing, which got this, now we have a system, was they started hitting random people up who had downloaded 1,500 songs and saying, hey, we're suing you. Or going to university and saying, we'll sue the university for hosting it. If somebody else created it, it's a copyright infringement unless it's a fair use. So I think the last uh, sort of slide that I'll talk about, and I know Marshall might want to open it up for more questions, is just about the importance of creating a social media policy. 
In our county, what we did is we decided, hey, there are a lot of legal issues here. So we involved HR, we invo involved the lawyers, we involved different departments that wanted to use social media. And we just had a round table and we met until we drafted a policy and it's fairly lengthy. It has uh, sort of civility guidelines. It has guidelines on personal use of social media while at work, work of social media for work purposes at work, who gets passwords to accounts, who can post, who can respond, how you should handle those sorts of things, how you should draft a policy or the terms of use for each Facebook use, for example. So if you want to set it up as information sharing only or a more open public forum, it basically is a template where you can copy and paste that information. So you can certainly get a copy of that from me if you want. I'm glad to send it to you or Marshall has that information. But I would strongly encourage you, and I know one of the speakers this morning uh, mentioned, uh, you can just Google uh, social media policies. I think he mentioned Philadelphia as one. You can Google it and get a copy and just use that as a starting place for discussion and then you come up with your own. And I think that's gonna really give you a lot of protection. And I think what's important, everything they said here isn't meant to scare you. It's actually meant to help you think about it in, in, in context. <laughs> and then create, it, create the policy, and then let the people know about the policy. We have time for a couple of questions, then we gotta move on. Yes, there in the back. Could you talk a little bit, thank you. Could you talk a little bit about um, what uh, elected officials are or are not allowed to publish on government websites um, for their bio page, that sort of thing? So I can speak in a general sense. This is one of those areas where I'd probably want to do a little more research before I spoke too extensively. The, there are restrictions on political activities. And so if they're using, for example, a county resource to put information up, um, it might be restricted to information about their district or about them as just general biographical information. If they're going to be doing a lot of um, you know, uh, political uh, lobbying, or not lobbying, but running for office, that really needs to happen on their own uh, page and not on county equipment. So it's an issue where you really need to work with council to figure out what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. All right, one more question. All right, I think we're done. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay.